Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for tuning in to Facebook for this event. I'm so very happy to be a part of um, this program. And uh, before I get started and really uh, get in, uh, into the program, I just wanna give a really big shout out to Brandon and um, his efforts with Story GMV. Um, I wanna thank you so much for being um, this beacon for us in terms of raising the aesthetic and emotional consciousness of our community. And it's so very needed right now in terms of what's going on. So thank you so much for that. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce myself a little bit so everybody will be familiar where I'm coming from. Uh, my name is Turbato. Turbato Maribu is my whole name. And I am a storyteller. And I've been a storyteller for about, often I say about, about 15 solid years, uh, 20 if you really ask me. <laughs> and um, I run a, run a, a, a company uh, that I just launched a few, uh, few months ago, really officially, uh, Deep Roots Arts and Culture Creative Services, LLC. And what I've been doing for a, a number of years in terms of visual and performing arts is really is telling, telling a story. And so I formed this company to, and to really bring the, my experience in, in terms of visual arts, in terms of performing arts, uh, and in terms of my love of culture and love of, of folk life. And so what my company does, we deal with visual and performing arts uh, in terms of telling uh, stories, myths, and narratives. Um, I really try to focus on, uh, one of my passions really is the culture of the African diaspora and really helping people understand the folkloric lifestyle that it has, but also everyone's lifestyle as well and how you can incorporate that into your own life. I also am a creative consultant and helping people deal with their creative process, which is very important to really move forward in terms of your life and changing your life, that creative factor is is very essential and but really the underlining of all of this is reclaiming your story and i think that that is so important so poignant in in, in these times in terms of, of what's going on right now and so you know we we were doing this program before uh COVID hit and now it seems that this this type of program is just the thing the ointment that the community needs so without further ado I will begin my program. So the stories we tell, how stories shape a community, how stories uh, help heal and allow a community to grow. And this is so essential in any time. A lot of people don't understand when you're dealing with a community, when you're dealing with, uh, with, it could be a community in terms of your family, could be a community in terms of your neighborhood, um, your town or city, or right, expanding out into the the county, the state. These are these are different aspects of the community, and we're all connected in one way or another. And everyone has a story in terms of that community. Now, let's let's delve a little bit in terms of what exactly are the aspects when we're talking about storytelling and we're talking about storytelling in terms of the community. Um, uh, and so I'm gonna give you some intellectual definitions in terms of that so we understand clearly, because a lot of people don't quite, under, they understand and they like storytelling, but it's really important to understand and it's really exciting uh, talking about this because we really don't understand how, it, how interwoven the story is in our personal lives and in terms of our community. So here's the act. Here's a definition, activity of sharing narrative, a narrative sometimes with improvisation through theater or embellishment. Uh, it describes the cultural beliefs and origins of a people. Uh, every culture has its own stories and narratives. And this extends out into the global community. Now, I understand we want to just not worry about the facts. Let's just get to the story. But I promise you, we'll, you'll understand this as we go. 
So let's understand a little bit about how the plot works in terms of a story, because you'll see as we as as this pro, as I explain these things, you'll understand how intertwined this aspect is in our own personal life. So, you know, a story it, it, it can be garnished and colorful, right? Um, can be easily disproven by science, but really in a story, no one cares. Uh, it also, of course, it has a villain. It has a hero, lots of strange phenomenon along the way. And uh, of course, it's allowed to have uh, super, uh, this person's allowed to have superpowers, uh, are just being clever uh, in, in, in their aspects. Um, there are gonna be some challenges to overcome. And hopefully there's a happy ending and an ethical message always there to remember. Now I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this, that, that this is, something you might see in terms of uh, a written story or something in terms of a movie or a plot, but this is also can be applied to your life and the life of a community. So a narrative, a narrative or stories an account of series, related events, experiences, uh, they can be uh, true uh, in terms of a travelogue, memoir, autobiography, biography are fictitious, um, which a lot of us enjoy, of course, the fairy, fairy tales, fables, stories, legends, and novels, and so on. Now, a lot of times you'll find that sometimes reality uh, can go into fiction, right? So keep that in mind. And of course, we have the myth. Now, mythology is very important. It's really talking about the tradition, uh, traditional aspects, traditional stories, uh, especially one concerning the early history of a people, uh, or explaining some natural or social phenomenon in terms of how it affects those people, and typically involving supernatural beings or events. And now, of course, you know, when we, so when we describe our, our events in a past tense, we tend to garnish, we tend to expand, and we want to bring in our own belief systems in terms of explaining events. And though people may share uh, a similar event, everyone's going to have their own interpretation of that. So um, you're going to see this slide later on, uh, but this is very important. I want you guys to understand um, one of the things that uh, is very important about understanding the different roles that people play in a story and in a story in a community. Now, Bill Morris speaks of eight distinctive characters in, characters in a story, but I added a, a, a one more, making it nine. Uh, and we have the hero, the damsel, the mentor, the threshold guardian, the herald, the shapeshifter, the shadow, the trickster, which is also the villain, can be the villain, the sidekick, which is the ally. Now, you need to understand that a lot of times when we're looking at our favorite program or looking at certain movies, we are looking at these particular uh, archetypes that, that play throughout the story. But I want you to pay attention that when we're living through our own experiences, that somewhere, somehow, someone is playing these archetypes. Someone is, is taking on this role in terms of the story being unfolded. So I want you to kind of think about the, you know, the hero and how that person, how we see the hero in terms of saving the day, in terms of coming along and saving the community or saving the people, right? And this usually can be, it doesn't matter really what size or what gender, a hero is someone that is, is being called upon reluctantly most of the time but is coming to um, fight up against a unsurmountable situation. And in the end, we hope that they, that they have victory and there's a happy ending. We have the damsel. Now the damsel uh, is, is someone that, that in, in certain cases, you, you kind of think of this, the woman always being rescued, right? But in modern times, the damsel doesn't always have to be uh, one person, the damsel can be the community itself, right? And, and in modern times, we see now that the damsel has taken on or transcended into this 
has shape shifted, as I explained, shape shifted into the hero. As we see in Sigourney Weaver's uh, image with aliens, she took on the role of the hero in terms of saving um, um, the, the uh, saving what was left of her crew, and the damsel took on uh, the role of the child. Uh, but at the same time, she herself was proving how independent she was. So you see, these characters can shift back and forth. Then we have the mentor. The mentor is someone that we see in in, uh, in a lot of our favorite pop culture movies and stories, and then you know, like Obi Wan, or um, we see Batman. And we see other characters that, um, that, that we have incorporated into our belief system, incorporated into our in, endearment um, of the, that person that, that is guiding the hero, that is molding the person into the, the actual person that they are supposed to be, that tra helping their, in their terms of their transitions, right? Then you have the threshold guardian. Now, the threshold guardian is someone that is standing at a place for the, before the hero goes into a next stage, they're standing there to explain exactly what's going on or, what, or, or to uh, under, understand exactly what the hero needs to understand and possibly answer questions that, that, that has been unanswered for a while. And the truth becomes revealed sometimes in a shocking way. Like you see the character of the architect in, in the Matrix Reloaded. Um, a lot of times they're guarding something, guarding some truth that we don't want them, they don't want people to understand or see. And you think, again, think about that, how that might relate to your community and how things unfold in terms of that threshold guardian. Then we have the Herald. Now the Herald is one who is announcing the situation warning people of, of something impending that is going to change or, or, or add uh, some type of disruption to the community. Uh, then we have the shapeshifter. Now the shapeshifter is someone that is made more from one character into another. They may seem like one thing and then they're going to all of a sudden uh, morph into another, right? Uh, you, they may seem like they're, they're good, but actuality, they're in disguise, right? Um, but we find that shape shifting can go from good to bad, or from good to another form of, of, of positivity, or back and forth. But in most cases, Eastern philosophies, there is no total good and there is no total bad. There is just that person being shifted back and forth in terms of that polarity. Then, of course, we have the shadow. Now, the shadow is usually not just a person. It is an actual unseen doom or unseen situation kind of looming through, right? Um, it could be, and in this case, think about it in terms of the plans unseen, right? And you'll understand that as we go into it. Now, we, of course, we have the trickster. Now, the trickster is a lot of cases, the, in most uh, indigenous stories, the trickster is someone that is pushing man or pushing uh, the individual or, or, or the community into another form of thinking. And they do things to uh, shift that person or shift those people into a situation where they have to learn something. But in this case, I also want you to think about the trickster as the villain as well. And sometimes they may make you think again that everything is just fine, everything is good, and that there's a shift about to come in terms of them changing their role. Then of course you have the sidekick. And that is the ally. Um, we see that many times there's always somebody that's aiding the hero or aiding someone, or it might be a group of people that's aiding um, the situation to um, fight against the, the villainous force uh, coming upon the, the community. Now, when we, now, of course, every ethnic group, every group uh, in terms of what has some type of interpretation of what they think a storyteller is. Now, when we think of storytellers, we might think of the, the whimsical character in terms of the European storyteller, who might have a little bit of, of Blarney in his voice in terms of telling you the right story, my boy. So sit down and perhaps I'll let you see how things will unfold under the rainbow. You see, so it's something in terms of that, you might think of a storyteller like that. 
We also might think of a storyteller in terms of folk, the folk country storyteller who has a voice that really expands out and talks to you about how big that fish was. And when I caught it, it was so big, I couldn't get it in the boat. So it's these, these kind of attitudes, you know, this, this approach that you may have in terms of, of that type of storyteller. Then you have uh, this, some, when you think of a storyteller, you might think of, of this character. Now, uh, this actually is a person that I know personally, his name is Teju Mola, and he's actually one of my mentors in terms of, of uh, how I emulate myself in terms of storytelling. And you might think of the, the, the griot who plays the drum and is telling the, the, um, the incorporating with call and response, I go, I may, I love ya, how are you today? We are going to tell you a story. So it's, it's these kind of, this kind of energy that we may think of in terms of a story. However, in reality, everybody is a storyteller. We all are storytellers. It doesn't matter what ethnic group, it doesn't matter what gender, we all have a story to tell. And if we pay attention in terms of our community and we put it all together, we can tell our story. It's important to understand that, that knowing your story is very important and understanding and how you can understand other people's stories in terms of their community is essential in terms of our future. And this will unfold as we go further into the program. So let's be clear now. Okay, so stories help shape human existence, right? Since time immortal is the weaving thread that binds us all. And we kind of, we don't always really understand this, but really this is how we as human beings think. The first time we put, um, we had, pictures on the caves, we were telling a story. The first time we started drawing on the ground because we could not communicate with each other, we were telling a story. Or we're weaving a quilt, or we're bringing out uh, some old heirloom, we're telling a story. So this is how we bind ourselves in terms of family, in terms of friends, and in terms of community. We think and retain information through stories by symbols and metaphors. So you need to understand that this is how we as human beings think. This is how we retain knowledge and retain our sense of who we are. We, in fact, we, it's, it's, it's been proven that if you look at images and relate them in terms of a small phrase or a small type of story behind it, your memory, your ability to retain that information comes quicker because that's how we store information. So for example, you might think of the snow is a white blanket, or he is a shining star. Her long hair was a flowing golden river. Tom's eyes were as ice as he stared at her. Swift as a rabbit, patient and as slow as a tortoise. So all these things bring about images. Wait, think about for a minute, what are you seeing when you hear these small phrases, these descriptions of people in terms of symbol and metaphor. That is how we are able to, uh, as storytellers, bring in the people and ignite their imagination. So um, we also draw stories from our history, our environment, experiences and how to deal with situations affecting you trauma such as war, sickness, or injury, to explain circumstances affecting yourself, your family, or community. So it's, a, it's, it's clear to understand like, like for example, right now, or you know, a wartime or, or, or in terms of a pandemic, you know, everyone's gonna have their own interpretation of this situation. Everyone's going to have their own um, focus on why this came about who brought this spiritually, or who brought this in terms of, 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 of human factor. And though it's the same situation, no one's gonna have the same point of view. So for example, one, one people's terrorist is another people's hero is along those same lines. But we must learn, learning how to see that in terms of objectivity is gonna be important to understand. So let's look at community. 
Now, an urban, we, we have different, you know, types of community. We have urban, suburban, rural, isolated, and open, right? Then the climate of that community may vary. A lot of people don't realize that. Not all communities are the same. We all have different, you know, communities that are, that may have a particular climate. Some may be very open. Some may have a, a sense of xenophobia about it. There might be a xenophilia about that community. And there also is a underlying of terms of narcissism with, with, with particular communities or climates of that community. Now, those people may be dealing, you know, when you're, you know, from, from various positions, but pay attention, you understand what I mean as we go through this. And the, every community you need to understand has some form of history, there are founders in regards to that community. They may be indigenous or may be migrating from other places in the world. They, are, they have cultural values. They, as eventually they develop their own educational institutions, rituals to maintain and to maintain that cohesiveness about that community. They develop economic hubs and they have social and cultural capital to be passed on to their children for the future. So, pay, you know, these are all the factors that a community has. And, and these, the mentality of how people see a community can either build or disrupt. And in terms of their story and how they receive their own story can affect, and I'll show you how this works. So, okay, so you have the inclusive creative community, right? Let's divide this up so you're very clear about what type of community you might be living in. So you have a collaborative situation. You have a uh, direction and the goals are decided on as a group. The resources and services are considered for all. They are consideration for others is one of the primary factors in being in the community. Extended family is, is extended to all, meaning, um, you may have relatives and, and uh, relations in one way in, in a family and in the community, but we all treat each other like family. Um, rites and rituals and traditions are shared. Diversity of ideas is encouraged. So you might see this in indigenous communities, smaller rural communities and villages, things like that. You might see this type of community. We also have communities, however, that might be xenophobic where they have a fear and, a, and even a hatred of strangers, of foreigners and any, anything foreign or other, right? So, you know, we have, you may walk into a community and we've seen this in the media, like, you know, where you're just minding your own business and we, we, we tend to think we, we are free uh, and have the freedom to move, but if you go into a community that has a xenophobic attitude, the, the consequences, the reactions may not be what you think, right? Then the opposite of that, we have xenophilia. And that's a means of the, uh, an affection for the unknown. Um, exotic items and cultures and people. But if you look a little bit deeper in terms of xenophilia, we still have that, we have this admiration, but in terms of the definition, it may be admiration of the things about that other people, but not necessarily the people themselves. Now, underlying all of this is a sense of ethnocentrism. And this is probably one of the more one of the more volatile attitudes in terms of one community story and coming in conflict or conflict or contact with another uh, community and their story. So you have this situation where the beliefs of one's culture, you, they have that attitude that they're superior to all other cultures. So in this way, um, we apply our own culture as a frame of reference in order to judge others and their practices and actions. So this is something that we see to this day. Um, here you see and an example of that is the actual painting of, um, of the action, this, this, this land process of how the West, Western man moved into the open plains in all parts of the United States, what we now know as the United States uh, of the Americas, that is. And 
they use the philosophy of manifest destiny. And here we see the actual painting in character of what manifest, manifest destiny looks like. And here we see this, this, this woman, uh, angelic in her presentation, moving across the land and behind her is, is the mechanisms of trains and carriages and modernism and, 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 uh, and, and industrial um, complexes in terms, of, in terms of, of this change and this disconnection. And in the process and the consequences, the moving out and pushing out of the indigenous people. And all under the attitude of we have a right to do this. We have a right, a God-given right, to take, this, to take these people's lands, that they're savages and they're not worthy of this. So therefore, uh, and we are, the, we are the better people. Our story is more, far more prominent than theirs. In fact, their story has no meaning to us. So you see how it's, we're thinking that it's, it's sometimes it's, 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 it's not just, you know, the other things that we call out in terms of bigotry or racism, and, but it's actually, you're dealing with one person's story and how they literally try to oppose or uh, place their story on another people. Now, basically where all of this is coming from in terms of our archetypes is the narcissist. This, um, the narcissist in, 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 in just about all stories is the villain or the supervillain and is being utilized and is utilizing the shape-shifting mode, is also using the trickster aspect. And we always feel there's this underlining shadow happening in terms of what's this change and we can't, just, just can't quite see it, right? So this is the psychological profile of the narcissist. He has been traumatized in childhood and becomes the villain based upon that, or a supervillain. Um, they 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 um, they force they tend to force their myth on others, and so your narrative literally becomes hijacked. Your narrative and myths become hijacked, and appropriation occurs. Right? They they take they tend to take all things, all resources in terms of in terms of how that story is played out. There's, and this develops this us and them and a demonization effect that tends to occur in terms of how your story is being perceived and how your story is being told. And so um, they have a grandiose sense of self-importance, the fantasy world that supports their delusions of grandeur. They have this, this dream and this fantasy about how they are and how the world should be. They need constant praise and admiration. A sense of entitlement is always upon this, this attitude and approach. And the exploits of others with, uh, and they, uh, in terms of their actions is without guilt or shame. And the frank, frankly, um, they demean, intimidate, bully, and belittle others constantly. This happens individually. And this happens, and this is a concept, and this is an understanding. If you understand in the past few hundred years, we have been actually been dealing with a narcissistic approach to all life, all human beings. Now, of course, that silhouette that I'm, that I'm showing, it's just a random silhouette, not by a distinctive, of course, but you understand that when we're dealing with this, please understand you are living right now a narcissistic story and it's unfolding as we speak. So here's, here's a, an example, and I want you to, want you to kind of you know, get a piece of paper and pencil as we go through our exercise, okay? Um, this is a community story versus social constructions. And um, I'll explain what social constructions are in a moment. So what we're, uh, I want you to kind of imagine in your mind right now, okay? Because this exercise is talking about the dangers of a senior story, the dangers of imposing your story, your beliefs, on another group or another community. So you're driving down the street that you're not familiar with. And it seems like a nice area and you're enjoying the drive, of course. And it's a beautiful spring day. You make a turn and look to the right and see, ah, five, four, three, 
two, one. What do you see? What do you think you just saw when you turned that corner? You see people, you see they're all gathered, but how are you interpreting that scene? Take two minutes to write down what you think is going on in that picture. Now remember the focus is what do you see? We all have our interpretation. We all have how, how we filter through our own stories, through our own, the social constructions given to us. So for example, you see these, this group of people looking out, is it a protest? Or is it simply them celebrating the rising of the sun? It's like the fishbowl effect. What stories really determines the accurate approach to a community and situation? So you're looking in the fish bowl. Are you looking at the fish? Or are you looking at the fish in a way that you filter it through your imagination and your social constructions of what you think a fish should be or act like or look like, right? And so when we do this, we tend to look and we tend to act on those social constructions. We tend to act on the story that we feel is more appropriate and more uh, favorable in terms of us. So in a lot of cases, this is not a very healthy approach to looking at any situation, especially when you're dealing with individuals are we you're dealing with a community? Yes. All right. So what was really going on in the picture? This is actually a gathering point, rendezvous point for the Lincoln homecoming parade. Now, Lincoln uh, High School was actually, I high school that closed down a number of years ago um, after, once um, integration came into play but it, it was a parade that was annual every year. Now, if you were driving into that situation with an interpretation of how you might see that community, you might not look at this as a gathering for a parade. You might look at it as something that is negative and threatening, something that you have to call the police to, to, to stop this situation right now. And we see that this, this, these, this type of phenomenon has been repeating itself over and over again in terms of the police, in terms of how people are perceiving um, people of color. You're actually dealing with how they're filtering their, their interpretation, how they're using the social constructions given to them and how they're looking at those people allows them, they feel they have permission to act on. Now, in reality, there's no further from any other American celebration, right? It's all part of the American dream. And we have all been given, or so we think, been given permission to live out that dream. Now, given now, this is a dream given to you. This is a narrative given to you. However, the American dream is not the American story. And it is dangerous living and being in someone else's story. Now, and so you see these, these examples that we have strived as African-Americans to be a part of this American dream. In most cases, it has been an American nightmare. And we don't always understand that in actuality what's happening is it's because you're not living your story and this happens with a lot of different people and we don't it could happen to the you know someone who is poor it could happen to someone who is uh it could happen to different factors someone who is asian someone who is uh indian or, or any type of immigration you know a factor in terms of that we all come to try to integrate and assimilate, right? But we're also told to, but 
you know, to forget our story can be dangerous. And as you can see, for example, in The Birth of a Nation, the movie that was set out um, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, this, um, th this concept and this uh, interpretation of the Ku Klux Klan being saviors um, has actually resonated to this day. And we still follow through the, those narratives and follow through with that um, social construction of how we should see the other, how America should see the other, right? So there's an African proverb, until the lion tells his own story, the hunter will always kill him in the end. And this is saying exactly what we're talking about now, not telling your own story. Now understanding the lion is also a hunter, but because the hunter, the human hunter is telling the story, the lion is always gonna have his demise. The hunter is always, the human hunter is always going to win until the lion decides to tell his interpretation of the story. So going back, so we're, we're understanding again this archetype. We are living this narcissist, narcissist dream pattern. And it's a pervasive character in most stories. And the narcissist usually tries to come as a savior. They try to come as the hero. But in actuality, they're the oppressors of all life. And we see this in many stories that we enjoy watching. Um, they are actually the cultural boogeyman. They are the ones that we all fear. And, they, and when they infiltrate into our communities, we don't realize that they're there. But when they do, it's too late. So you see Ming the Merciless, um, Sauron from Lord of the Rings, and of course, Voldemort from Harry Potter. These all are different characters, but all, sh all share the same archetype and same mentality in terms of the narcissist. Now, in actuality, this character, this framework of this story that we are, are experiencing or enjoy in terms of pop culture is something that's been repeated um, since time immortal. So you have these characters that are an essential template, right? And so they have shaped a lot of our thinking in terms of Western thought. So you, at the beginning of this, it really comes from Egypt or Kemet. And so you have Osir or Osiris, you have Set or Seti, or you have Horus or Heru. And of course, the story goes that Set was very jealous of his brother, Osiris, and he tricked him and found a way to uh, trap him in a box so he could cut him up in many pieces and scatter him across the world. And the wife of Osiris, Isis of or Osir, found um, one part of him that was essential, his reproductive organs. And in that, they conceived the son. And the son grew up as Haru or Horus, and he became the hero. He fought against Set and defeated him and restored light and balance back to the kingdom and the world. Now, if you look over at the Lion King, you will see this similar tale. If you look at Star Wars, you will see this similar tale. So these types of um, stories actually shapes our thinking and how we create our own personal stories. Now, this is a classic example of taking on archetypes in terms of, of, uh, of stories that shape us. Here we see J. Edgar Hoover. And he is best known, of course, being the director of the FBI. And the major um, uh, component, his, his, his role in playing and, 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 and dismantling um, most uh, civil rights groups and, and um, human rights groups during the uh, civil rights era and black power movement. Now he created a Countel Pro initiative. And that's basically, uh, if you break it up, if you, it's actually the counterintelligence program. And so I want you to pay attention to this one factor. You can read the whole thing on your own, but it's basically saying in his memo in 1968, he said to prevent the coalition of militant black nationalists 
groups to prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify the militant black nationalist movement, right? Now, so he understood the story of the coming of a messiah. And he deliberately put that to ignite and engage people's story memory bank in terms of how to how to see those people uh, that he was talking those people he was talking about. And so literally he took on the role of King Herod himself and going out and finding the firstborn child and to prevent the coming of the Messiah. And to this day, the Counter Pro uh, initiative is still going on today. The King Herod aspect is still going on today. So you see, we are, you see how other stories affect our communities and we're not even privy to it. We're not even understanding it and being able to break out of that cycle and telling our own story is essential. So let's reiterate the social construction aspect. You know, um, in terms of housing and community, social constructions define, uh, can be defined as race or gender through nature, class, religion, and in terms of how it affects you personally, it determines how you think of yourself masculine or feminine, or in terms of self-reflection or your self-esteem, how you think about what you're going to do as far as work, how you choose who you're going to marry, um, how you bring your children up, and your health. All these things are social constructions, and they fit us into the archetypes of the story being told, whether we like it or not. So self-check again. Have you ever fallen into a narcissist thought trap? Have you ever acted on the thoughts to validate your own story or to fit in with the group? And we call this actually a form of tribalism, which can easily turn into the mob. So I want you to think about this as we as as we moving towards the end of this. What role do you play in the community story? Know where you are, and who you are in this story being played out as we speak. The story is being told. You like horror? No problem. You like comedy? We got that. You like suspense thriller? Here you go. Think about where you are, who you are, play a new role if it's causing harm and create a new future for your community. Think what character are you in the story, in this check-in, right? In your group, in your tribe, in your association, and do you need to change that role. So again, going back to the archetypes, what do you think you are? Where are you playing in this? And think about the people around you. And if you pay attention, for example, the things going on in terms of gentrification, the things going on in terms of, of Black Lives Matter, the things going on in terms of COVID-19, you will, if you pay attention, you will see these archetypes being played out and they are being played out in your community. But think about it, where's the hero? Who is the hero? I'm just gonna leave it right there for you. So I like to think of it like this. We need a prime directive. Now I'm a, I am a huge fan of Star Trek. And it's not just because of the characters and the sci-fi theme, it's because of the philosophy they have. And that's the prime directive. I'm being very serious right now. If you pay attention to that story, you will see that they are telling us, that Gene Roddenberry is trying to tell us in order for us to evolve, in order for us to move forward and move out of the, the loop and the, the, the narcissist um, storyline, we have to recreate certain guidelines that and philosophies 
that help us protect our stories, protect those people who tell those stories. A prime directive for all communities, prohibiting all governmental and corporate entities from interfering with the internal and natural development of any community ever again. Now, of course, the UN has attempted to do this, other agencies have attempted to do this, but the, 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 that this, this story is still being played out. But we have a choice in what role are we gonna to play to bring this to an end in our favor, yes? So pay attention and keep in mind that, you know, the narcissist thinking must end. There is no compromise in this. If you understand exactly what that is and the compassionate thinking must be restored. You're basically dealing with two different attitudes on the same spectrum, one of apathy, or one of empathy. And if you have seen The Matrix, I love, I love these characters in terms of the apathetic approach uh, by the architect and uh, the logic and calculated and the, um, the empathetic approach from the oracle. And so taking on and understanding this interpretation is very essential in terms of sitting down and rewriting our stories and reclaiming our stories and narratives. So to go further, as you as an individual can do this by yourself, you too can teach a group or your family how to engage in terms of, of other people's stories in, in terms of their community. Don't impose your views, your opinions and beliefs and politics on others. Do not interrupt the natural course of a community and their progress. The key is objectivity. Observe without action. Listen without judgment. Learn to understand the situation and the people and not use that information to exploit, but simply to understand and give respect. Give with no expectation and receive with diplomacy. So th this, this understanding of, of, of really coming into the world and, and, and appreciating everyone's story and not taking on the role of the narcissist, not taking on the role that is, is, is trying to delete or invalidate someone else's story or the community they have, will begin the process of other creative thinking and other creative solutions that will help change our present condition in our society today. So I leave you with this. Tomorrow belongs to the people who claim their own story today. I hope you enjoyed this program. I am so privileged and feel so honored to be a part of this initiative. Again, if you want to uh, contact me or can or continue uh, any discussion, you can find me on, on uh, uh, Facebook and you will find me at, under Trabado Marabou. Or you can also reach me uh, under Deep Roots Arts and Culture Creative Services LLC. I have a page there. And you can also look for my videos and uh, on YouTube as well under the same name. And please, um, please keep, uh, keep an eye out on any future pro uh, programs dealing with Story GMV. I would definitely be a part of that. And remember, when you're telling your own story, make yourself the hero and make it a happy ending. Thank you.